Greetings, everyone. Welcome to First Suit Making 101. This will be a one, one and a half hour panel where we'll be talking about the ins and outs of first suit making from head to tail. This is a beginner oriented or designed panel, uh, so we will be doing over more basic techniques. Uh, for those who are already have some first suit making under their belt, we will be doing a first suit making 102, which is a uh, the second part of this panel later today, we will be going over the more advanced techniques. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar with me, my name is Kale, and I am the owner of Twilight Nights Cosplay, a fursuit making company. Um, and let's drop into things. So, to get right started, there are what we call the three B's of heads. And those are the three different ways that one can make a head. Those are the balaclava, the bucket, and the base. Now each of those have their own pros and cons. For the balaclava method, it is tricky to size for other people because you need to be able to uh, kind of put it on and off constantly while making it to ensure a good fit. Because um, making it on an egg head is a little bit more difficult, um, simply because it is built on a stretchy elastic. Uh, the balaclava heads tend to be the smallest of the three different types of head bases. Uh, moving jaws are possible, but they can be a little bit finicky to set up because you need to use uh, elastics and you have to get the tension just right. Otherwise, it can be difficult to get them to uh, move, especially if you're trying to side this for other people. However, when it's done right, they tend to be the most responsive of the jaw types. Uh, they're also the lightest of the heads. The next type are the buckets. This is probably the most popular type of way to build a fursuit head, especially for um, you know newer makers or as well as those who are very confident at carving. Um, now, the heads tend to be physically larger than a balaclava or a base, but they're actually quite snug on the inside because it's all th like complete foam. You're all completely cased in. They're also very light. They're a little bit heavier than a balaclava, but not by much, not by any significant margin. They can have a moving jaw, but again, they're, they tend to be a little bit finicky to, to do. They're also a little bit more clunky and not as reactive. You can't get a, a large amount of jaw movement from them, I find. Uh, the next method for uh, head ba heads are the base. A uh, base is a head that's already been pre-made by another maker, uh, which is why they're most commonly used by professional makers. Bases are casted out of foam or resin and can be done in a wide variety of shapes and can be easily modified, it, modified with a little bit more uh, bulking up with foam, which, you know, gives them a lot more versati uh, versatility. And because they're a base that's been casted, you kind of already know what they're going to look like versus trying to carve something from scratch. You already have the shape there for you. So in my personal opinion, for new makers, I recommend going with a base first because then you know exactly what it's going to look like before you even fur it. Uh, the physical size difference between a balaclava and a, a bucket uh, it's it's in the medium, so it's a bit bigger than the balaclava uh, method, but, but smaller than a bucket method. But despite this, despite being on the smaller side for a fursuit head, it's actually very roomy on the inside. A few moments later. It's actually probably the roomiest one of the bunch because the, it's all hollowed out, whereas a balaclava head is built right on your face and a bucket is much the same where it's right here. The uh, a foam base is actually hollowed out, so you have this nice, you know, concave surface uh, on the inside of the mask, which I personally find is a little bit better for breathability. But again, it's a personal preference thing because some people like the uh, bases to be snug to their face. I like them to be a little bit further away to allow more airflow. It's also easier to install a fan uh, because there's room for the air to circulate. You can't really install a fan on a balaclava or a bucket built head because there's no way for the air to circulate. Um, so, you know, each has their own pros and cons, but there's no right way or wrong way uh, to do it uh, in terms of like picking balaclava base or bucket. Each one has their own pros and cons. There's no, no one is the clear cut winner. They all have positives and negatives. My personal preference is for base. I build all my heads on bases. Now, the one big positive for bases that 
no other head has is that they can be 3D modeled and printed and then molded from there, which means they can be perfectly symmetrical, which is fantastic because it's very difficult to make a head perfectly symmetrical when you're carving it. Now, professional makers can get very, very, very close, but it will never be as perfect as, say, what a computer can do when it's 3D printed. Um, now, some bases can be designed specifically to have moving jaws. Like, for example, realistic heads have moving jaws. So, uh, heads that are casted can be specifically modeled or designed to incorporate a moving jaw, which allows for more, more reliable movement when letting other people, uh, when, when making heads for other people. Um, they can also be casted out of foam or resin. Now, they are the heaviest of the bunch, especially if you're casting them out of, out of resin. They're very heavy. But, again, they all have their pros and cons. Now, f regardless of whether you are making a head uh, with the bucket method or, the, or a balaclava, the methodology is relatively the same. Now, whenever you're carving a head, you're going to want, whether you have a base, or even if you're using a base, you're going to want to buy something called an Ed Head. An Ed Head is a anatomical human analog. Now, you, a lot of people say, well, can I just go buy a wig head? Yes, you can technically go buy a wig head, but you do not want to build a first aid head on it. A wig head is just that. It's meant for displaying a wig. They're not accurate human analogs. They might look like a human head, but they're not sized correctly. A wig head is typically around 19 to 22, usually 21, 19 to 21 inches around uh, measuring at the brow, whereas the average human head is around 22 to 24. So unless you're building a first head for a child, a wig head is your worst enemy because you're going to build this beautiful head, spend all this effort on, and then when you go to put it on, you're not going to be able to, it's not going to fit. Um, now, and head heads are expensive. Uh, so if you're going to be building more than one head, or if you're building a fursuit head for someone else, not for yourself, an Ed head is a must. Otherwise, you have to constantly try the head on and off. Uh, while making it, which you should always do, but it's going to be a lot more tedious. Um, now, Ed Heads can be purchased from a couple different companies depending on where you live in the world. Uh, they are sold by Monster Makers in the US, which is actually the company that makes them. But Smooth On and Sculpture Supplies also sell them, and they'll sell you back around $75 US to $100 Canadian. Um, and they come in two different styles. The Alana, and I believe the male is called Steve, <laughs> I think. Um, the Alana, which is the female one, is slightly smaller. It's about a 21 to 23 inch head, whereas the male is about 22 to 24 inch, in terms of like how large of a head it fits. Um, but, uh, you know, they all have their pros and cons. Uh, I think I'm going to turn on my light possibly because the sun is starting to set so it's like a little dark. Give me 10 seconds. 20 minutes later. I don't know if that actually made any visible difference, but in my mind it did at least. Um, so regardless of the methodology, uh, whether you're doing a bucket or base or a, sorry, a bucket or a, balac uh, a balaclava, the methodology for actually carving a head is relatively the same. You'll want to buy one inch foam for carving the head. Uh, now you can use thicker foams, but you'll, then you'll be shaving off more of it uh, rather than building up layers. There's, you know, no right or wrong way. You can either, you know, build up or shave down. There's, again, no right or wrong way. But one inch foam is cheaper, which is why most people tend to use it for carving a head base. As for where you can buy it, you can actually buy a roll of upholstery, a one inch upholstery foam from Walmart for about 15 to $18 uh, Canadian. So you'll want to cut out all these pieces on one inch foam. And now I've drawn up a rough template of roughly what those different pieces look like. If we look at the muzzle piece here, that is quite literally the muzzle. But you can't just carve two of these and slam them together. It needs to have width. So that's why you need a, a piece that goes down the middle. And that goes essentially at the top here, sandwiching between the two pieces to give it the depth. Now, depending on what animal you're making, these shapes will change. Like the ear shape will change, the cheek shape will change, you know, the muzzle shape will change. Now, the drawing that I have here is roughly for a canine, uh, just because 
it's the quickest uh, example I can make. Also, canines are the most popular. So, you know, teaching someone how to make a canine fursuit, I'm going to be able to hit a large number of you rather than saying, this is how you to make an axolotl. I'm going to hit no one. <laughs> I'm going to hit, like, maybe one person if I had, like, a large uh, watching or follow account, follower count. I can't word right now. Now, for the uh, muzzle, uh, for this is a canine, you'll want to cut two pieces out of one inch foam. Now, with this, you won't need to mirror it because you can just, it's, it's foam. There's no left, there's no what we call the wrong side. You'll need to cut one of the, the muzzle middle, which is the part that basically determines how wide the muzzle is. Uh, you can play with the shape of these in order to create a wide variety of different animals and species. Now, the muzzle bridge is the piece that goes, if we go back to here, so this, I should have gone here on the first size. So, can I draw on this? I don't know how Google Slides works. Pointer. Okay, that kind of works. Okay. So, where is my tablet? Ah, here we go. Okay. So, the muzzle piece is this piece right here. It's the part of the, the mouth that actually, you know, forms a curve around the face. Now, whenever you're going to be making the, uh, all the pattern pieces here, it's all going to be very two-dimensional, which is why you're going to want to either cut multiples of them or, or uh, cut um, it out of thicker foam and then carve it down so that it becomes round like this when it's done. Because in the beginning, it's all just going to be very flat and two-dimensional. But your muzzle piece are the two pieces here. The, um, the muzzle bridge is this middle part here. It's the top flat part. And the, uh, what did I call it? The, sorry, the muzzle bridge is this little triangle right here. That basically creates this nice sloping effect. If you don't have that, it's going to be, you're going to have a very straight drop from forehead to muzzle. And it's not going to look natural. So this little triangle piece is exceptionally important for how small it is. Then, of course, you're, you have your eyebrows, which go, well, at the eyebrows. You'll want to put them on either side of the muzzle bridge right there. Oops, sorry, I went too far. And you'll glue them essentially above your actual eyebrows. Now, so they'll be like, you know, obviously here. And they'll want to be like go down quite a bit because they need to connect into the cheek itself. So, which brings me to the next point. Oh gosh, I'm flipping all over the place. So, your cheek shape is quite a specific shape. And the reason why it has this little indentation right here is because this is what creates the smile or the expression on the fursuit. So by controlling the angle and depth of this, we can make a, a, a character look angry or sassy or happy. So if we want a really big, happy character, we obviously make this much bigger and deeper. Uh, if we want a, you know, a more angry character, we, we bring it down more. Um, so if we look here, so this is, this is the triangle essentially on a base. It's this big in-depth here. So with a foam piece, it's actually cut out. So this is negative space, which means there's nothing there. But on a casted foam base, it's an indentation. So this is actually a very important shape. So this is the one part of the um, uh, cutting of the pieces that you want to take extra care to because this is the one that controls the expression of the character. Uh, then the reason why it extends a little bit further down here is that it can actually connect to, uh, going back here, so the cheek part goes to about here on the uh, foam piece and it ends here and then we're going to create two long thin pieces they're going to be the sides of the jaw right here. And then we're going to have a flat center piece, which is going to create the actual bottom of the jaw. So otherwise it's just going to be straight and you're gonna have no bottom jaw. It's just gonna fall through space and it's gonna look very silly. You're gonna look like you have mandibles, um, you know, like an insect, <laughs> which I mean, if you're making an insect, cool. If you're making a dog, not so much. Um, so you'll wanna cut two cheeks, you know, one for each side, and then you'll want to cut two of the sides of the jaw, but only one of the actual bottom of the jaw itself, which is uh, indicated here. 
Then, of course, you want to do your nose. And this is the one piece that you'll definitely want to carve out of a thicker foam, you know, probably like a two inch foam or three inch foam, and you'll carve it down and round it to the actual shape of the, the uh, creature that you want it to be, cat, dog, whatever have you. Um, and you'll glue it all on. Then, of course, you have your ears, and if you have a uh, bucket, you'll actually be gluing it, uh, sorry, if you have a balaclava, you'll be gluing it directly to the balaclava itself, um, whereas with a bucket, you'll be gluing it to the whole base. Um, and once you have everything cut out, you'll want to glue everything, of course, and then you can carve it. So carving is very simple. You're going to take a pair of scissors, and you're going to slowly trim around the edge of the foam, um, and then you're... And then by doing that, you're going to slowly round out the shape. Now, with the cheeks and the muzzle, you'll probably want to cut out a second copy of the muzzle, but you'll want to cut it out smaller than the first one so that you can get that nice curve. And, of course, you'll want to try it on as you're creating it to ensure a proper fit. Sorry if I'm rushing through this, I want to try and get everything in in the one hour that we have. So it's a lot to go over, but I will take questions at the end. Once you have uh, your head uh, all carved out and you're happy with the shape, the next, met the next part is to either create the eyes or go straight to duct taping. There's no right or wrong way to do it. I usually make my eyes uh, and install them before I duct tape, but you can do it afterwards. In this particular example, which is actually a head that I did, I carved the eyes, uh, I made the eyes afterwards. But you'll want to duct tape the entire head. Now some people are like, well if I duct tape the head, I'm going to pull the foam off. Yes. And it doesn't matter. Now, a lot of people panic about that because you're going to be ripping possibly bits of foam whenever you uh, take the duct tape pattern off. So, which is why it's important to you go slowly, and in my case, use cheap, shitty duct tape because they're your best friend. Because it doesn't stick very well, so it's not going to rip the foam. And even if it does rip a little bit of the foam, you can either re-glue it down, fix the shape, or if it's really, really only a small, tiny bit, it's not going to affect the furring, so it doesn't matter. So, once you, ha once you do so, you're going to duct tape the entire head. If you are doing a bucket, you'll want to duct tape uh, obviously the entire head, the uh, back of the, the, the skull, the face itself, and the neck. Um, so you can either duct tape it all at once or duct tape in sections. There's no really right way or wrong to do it. I tend to duct tape the face first for the face, duct tape the back of the head and neck, uh, which is called the hood, um, and then, you know, fur it and attach it. There's no right or wrong way in terms of the order of things. As long as you do it, it doesn't matter the order. There's So you'll duct tape the entire head, uh, or half of the design is symmetrical. If you're, if you're using a casted base, the base itself is likely to be symmetrical, so you only need to duct tape half of the head, uh, or if the design is symmetrical. If you are, uh, if you did a carved head base, you'll 100% uh, want to duct tape the entire thing because even if it looks symmetrical to you, the actual pattern pieces will not be symmetrical because it's, you know, it's not actually going to look uh, symmetrical as you think it does. Um, and the pieces will vary very slightly, you know, between the left and the right side of the face. You'll want to mark the fur direction. Now, fur has a pile. So that means that the fur will lay in one certain way, and if you push it back the other way, it'll eventually fall back to the way it was originally done on the backing. I'm not sure if that makes sense the way I've described it, but you'll have to bear with me. So you'll mar want to mark the fur direction, and fur will flow on a face in, uh, in a different way than it will, say, on the paws or the body. So it's very important to you know, understand how fur looks on animals. If you're ever unsure which direction the fur should be facing on a fursuit, go look up a picture of the animal that you're trying to mimic and take a look at how the flow fur flows on their body. In the case of a head, it will flow from the, t from the, uh, from the nose heading back towards the back of the skull. And then on the cheeks, it will go back back and then it will slowly go down like so I'm, I'm drawing arrows not that it makes sense the way I'm doing it with my laser pointer 
So it's very important to, to mark the fur direction. Otherwise, you don't want to start patterning and cutting out your fur and then realize you have it backwards and then be like, oh crud, I've wasted all this time and all this material because fur is quite expensive. Now, I also highly recommend marking not just the fur direction and the actual markings of the character, but the seams itself. That indicates where you should be cutting things because if you just put a seam not pay attention to your seams, you will have a seam in a really bad spot where it'll be super visible on the final product. So controlling where you put your seams can make a very well seamless looking head. I personally tend to put my seams right here where the muzzle meets the cheek, here where the top of the cheek meets the bottom of the jaw, the back of the cheek for to indicate the curve, this is called a dart, the top of the eyebrow to indicate a curve, which is a dart. And yeah. Um, so then I have the, so let's see, I have one piece, two piece, three piece, four piece. I can get my face done in four pieces, depending on how you pattern it. And that's four seams rather than 40 seams, which makes a big difference, especially when you're working with short piled furs or working with, for example, uh, scaly creatures like lizards and dragons, where you want to make it out of, say, minky or fleece, for example, uh, rather than fur. Then, of course, you'll want to draw your markings. And with an asymmetrical character, you'll have to keep close mind that the left is the right and the right is the left. Because when you make your pattern, you need to flip it. So the left piece becomes the right piece, and the right piece becomes the left. Otherwise, you're going to end up with the wrong side. Uh, it might be a little tricky, but for those who have done any sort of sewing, it'll make sense. Um, and the best way to find out is trial and error. If you, if, and looking up tutorials. Uh, speaking of which, uh, there are a plethora of fursuit making tutorials out there, but for those who are just getting into it, there's a really solid uh, tutorial out there called Mattresses, um, which is done by, well, Mattresses, the fursuit maker. Uh, this tutorial, I haven't looked at it in a long time, so it's probably out of date, as a, a lot of new techniques and materials have come on the scene in terms of fursuit making. But it is still a very solid tutorial, as it gives you a lot of the foundation that you need for building a fursuit. And it covers the entire thing, from head to tail to paws to feet, everything you need to get started. I think they also give you some uh, indications as to where you can buy materials as well, but I can't recall. It's been quite a while. Now, you'll obviously want to label. You can't just draw the markings and be like, okay, hey, cool. You'll want to like be like, okay, hey, this marking is brown. This marking is white. Otherwise, you'll when you actually start cutting out all your pieces, you're going to be like, what is this weird squiggly line? I don't understand what the shape is, and I don't understand what part of the face it's for. So labeling everything is very important. Once you've got everything labeled out, you can cut it all out and you can begin sewing it. Now with a uh, with pieces like the cheek and the muzzle and the eyebrows, they're curved. So you can't just cut out the duct tape and squish it on the fabric and call it a day. For any piece of the fabric uh, of the duct tape that doesn't lie flat, you'll want to cut a, uh, just a straight line into it, and that's called a dart, so that when it opens up, it becomes like a Pac-Man. So if you draw a circle, and you cut a line into it, and then push it down on the fabric, it becomes like a Pac-Man shape. So that whenever you're sewing it back, you indicate that those two pieces have to join, and that creates a curve, and that's called a dart. So the darts are extremely important. You'll want them, obviously, on your face, typically around the cheeks, the muzzle, and the eyebrows. On, for example, tails, if you have, like, big husky tails, you know, that, those big curves are important unless you're cutting each piece segmented, um, you know, so on and so forth. But darts are extremely important into uh, getting the curve. So once you have all of your pattern pieces cut out and you've made sure that the fur direction is correct, you can do something called pre-shaving. So if you're working with a one and a half inch pile of fur, you'll typically want to shave it down just a little bit just so it's a little bit easier to see where the markings are, where the seams are, in order to get things to line up whenever you're sewing them. 
Um, and speaking of sewing, uh, you can machine sew things or hand sew things. There's no right or wrong way. I typically recommend hand sewing any small markings, such as spots or small stripes, and then machine sewing any large pieces. Um, <clears throat> what was I going to say next? Uh, I've just completely lost my train of thought. Herp a derp, derp a derp. Uh, so what can I talk about next? Uh, ah, yes. So because fur has a pile, whenever you are cutting out and joining uh, your pieces, you'll want to make sure that you tuck all of the fur in. You can't just be like A side plus B side equals shove into machine. Uh, because if you do that without tucking all the fur in the seams, you'll end up with very big, very visible streams that will, uh, seams, they'll be very bumpy and they won't lay flat. So tucking all the fur into the seam itself when sewing it will help create a small, thin uh, seam that's not going to be very visible. And of course you'll want to, you know, trim it down. So if you give yourself a seam allowance uh, and you sew down, you might want to trim it down so it'll help it lay it flatter whenever you're gluing down the head. Uh, just a little extra tip for you. Sorry if my brain is not working well today. This panel was put together very quickly and now I'm pooping it out super fast, so it's rough. <laughs> it's not the first time I've done this panel though, so I'm not completely at a loss, but it has been a while since, uh, yep. And normally I'm talking to an audience, so I have, you know, some crowd interaction. I kind of can build off of them and they can remind me of things I might have forgotten or ask questions. Doing a live stream panel is a little bit more tricky, so please bear with me. Uh, so, pre-shaving, um, your pattern pieces can help you see uh, where your seams line up and help make sure that the markings look the way you want to before you actually glue it onto the head. Uh, pre-shaving is not required, but it does make your life a little bit easier. Uh, when shaving, you definitely want to use a, uh, uh, a good razor. You'll definitely want to use a pet clipper, but I'll get to that in a bit. Um, once you have all of your stuff sewn down, you can test fit it to the head, see how you're doing. Um, and then if you haven't already, you can move on to making the eyes. Now, a lot of people are familiar with the terminology 2D and 3D eyes or follow me eyes. And those basically indicate basically whether an eye will, uh, is static or it's in a fixed position where it's always looking forward or a follow me eye where it has the optical illusion where it looks like it's looking at every single person in the room. Um, so uh, do, 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 those are done simply by an optical illusion. Uh, miles of Fox and secure bag times one. I don't know what that is, but thank you, I think. <laughs> I don't know what that is, I'm afraid. <laughs> I don't know, I, this is my first time streaming on TikTok. I know nothing. Um, so vision is through the eye, so it's very important to have a very good quality mesh. Now, a lot of people, when you go look up tutorials online or start asking people how to make fursuits or whatever have you, all of them will tend to say the same thing. Make your eyes out of buckram, which is a big no-no. Buckram is cheap. It's accessible, and you can't see shit out of it, <laughs> uh, which is why you don't want to use it. Uh, buckram eyes have very, very small holes, and they're very, very close, uh, close together. So it allows some vision through, but the vision is very limited and it's very tinted. Um, so it's not, it's not advised. Now, the only good thing about Buckram is that anyone with a home printer can print directly onto the mesh because it is so, there's so much fabric because the holes are so small and they're so close together that, uh, you know, ink will actually take to it. Um, but for, you know, anyone who actually wants to see out of their heads, uh, I recommend uh, a good mesh material. Now, uh, the two most popular ones are something called Ida cloth, which is usually made out of vinyl. Uh, this is what a lot of professional makers use. Uh, and the next one is window screen for those who can't get a hold of Ida cloth. Window screen, like literally the screen in your windows. You can buy them at Walmart, Home Depot, pretty much any hardware store for like 20 bucks. So you get a shit ton of it and it's very easy to work with. All you need to do is layer it uh, where the grid faces one way and then the grid faces the other way so that it creates a diamond. 
uh, which basically you know helps block out people from seeing directly into you, uh, and it gives uh, the paint more surface area to adhere to. And then you just simply paint it the way you normally would with buckram eyes or Ida cloth eyes. Um, and then of course uh, you can also print the eyes. Now printing eyes is a little bit more of an advanced technique and uh, if you're printing on Ida cloth or similar type materials, you'll either want to get it done professionally by, a, you know, like some sort of local graphics design company or get a really, really expensive printer that are like $4,000 um, or do, uh, what was it called, supplemental inking. Uh, but that's a topic for another day. So after you've painted the actual eyes, you're going to want an encasement. That's the whites of the eye, so the, the sclera. Because um, you paint only the iris and the pupil, which is the colored parts of the eye. Uh, now the encasement can be made out of foamies, which is most common for first time fursuit builders, uh, as well as uh, plastic or resin um, or even 3D printed. Um, and those can be done in 2D or 3D. With a 3D eye, um, you need to have more pieces to it. So with a 2D, 2D eye, where is my laser pointer? Here we go. So with a 2D eye, it is quite literally just a flat plane and you will basically put the casement over, you know, the side of it so only the uh, pupil and iris is showing. Uh, and those can, the pupil and iris will tend to be off-centered to slightly one side so that it's looking forward or looking to the left or looking to the right, whatever expression you want on your final suit. With a follow me eye, the pupil has to be directly in the middle and there has to be a uh, depth between the actual uh, bottom of the eyes and the sides of the eyes because that creates the 3D follow me effect. Whereas a 2D eye is just, just a flat pane at the bottom. Um, there are plenty of first to making tutorials on how to build eyes, uh, so I'm not going to go a super in-depth tutorial on it, but just know that putting your pupil and iris directly in the center for a follow me eye is very important as that helps create the follow me effect as simply just putting a, uh, you know, a, a, a 3D encasement around a 2D I will not really give you the effect you're after. Um, and then afterwards you can install the eyes in the head if you haven't done so. Again, you can install the eyes before duct taping it or after duct taping it. There is no right or wrong way to do it. Um, I typically tend to install my eyes first and then duct tape them. Um, but in this particular example that I did, uh, I uh, duct taped the head first and then installed the eyes. There's no right or wrong way. It, it's literally just a preference thing. So, once you have all of your pattern pieces cut out and the eyes are installed, if you haven't done so already, you will add darts where they need to. You'll assemble them uh, and sew them together, pre-shaving any pieces that are very, very long, uh, if desired, test fit it, and then you'll glue it down. I typically tend to do all of the face first, gluing it down, shaving it, and then making the uh, back of the head, the hood, and the ears, but you can do it all at once. Uh, there's no right or wrong way in terms of, uh, you know, what order you do things. But uh, for anyone who is making a uh, fursuit head, you'll typically want to shave at least this part, pre-shaving it. Um, the rest of the, you know, this part upwards where it goes into the bridge or the back of the cheeks, you don't really need to pre-shave that as you'll be able to uh, gradually uh, shave it where it looks like a more natural um, uh, flow from the short fur to the long fur um, versus, you know, if you had shaved the entire thing. Uh, but you can also cheat it a lot by just simply using a short pile fur, <laughs> which is what most makers do. We tend, most uh, makers like myself, we tend to buy a short pile fee fur, usually called a beaver or a teddy or a bunny fur, which are tend to be around a half inch to one inch pile furs. Uh, and we'll usually cut the muzzle uh, and the bottom jaw out of these fur pieces. Uh, so we have less shaving to do and it looks a little bit neater, a little bit cleaner, a little bit more professional. 
As for shaving, uh, you'll want to use pet clippers um, to shave the head. And you'll want to go slowly, take your time, especially if this is your first time. You don't want to try to rush it and then end up with a bald spot that's going to be another thing to repair, which is you can repair bald spots. Bald spots, wow, words. Um, now, I highly recommend using a guard, which are the little plastic or metal clips that go over the blade themselves. They um, basically tell, they basically stop the clipper from cutting any shorter than what the guard physically allows by physically distancing the, the blades from the fur that you're cutting. Um, so I highly recommend using uh, clipper blades while you're still learning. Um, you know, more professional makers or more experienced makers won't use, won't use um, the uh, guards at all or very little. I will only typically use them if I'm cutting really long fur and I just want to pre-shave it or if I need it to be all a very specific length of fur. But once you're, you know, you're happy with the, with the, the with the shaving, uh, you know, and you're happy with gluing everything down, then you can go on to making the ears and the back of the head um, if you haven't already. Then after that, you have to clean up the head. So you, this is where you clean up the shaving, you know, after you're satisfied with everything that's been glued down. Uh, you add the eyeliner, which is the little black that goes over the eyes themselves. Otherwise, it looks very strange. So right here, there is no uh, little black eyeliner around the eyes. So it's, it's just raw edge of the fur plus the raw edge of the plastic, which isn't very clean looking. It's not very nice looking. So you'll just want to add like a little bit of fleece or a little bit of felt around the top part of the eyes here. Um, oops. Uh, around the top part of the eyes here to get that look. You don't need to go all the way around unless you want to make a very goth looking character. Um, but yeah. Then you can add the teeth and the tongue if you haven't already. Teeth can be uh, either sculpted out of clay, they can be uh, sculpted out of fleece or minky. You can actually pattern and uh, create teeth out of fleece or minky just by simply drawing it and stuffing it. They're a little bit tricky to do. I don't personally like doing them. I tend to do my teeth out of uh, 3D printed uh, PLA or resin. Uh, in this particular case, these teeth are 3D printed. Uh, and then you'll just simply glue them, or in the case of uh, teeth that are uh, sewn, you'll want to sew them to the uh, bottom of the jaw. And then you'll want to install the nose if you haven't done it already. Uh, I'm, I typically install my nose afterwards. So in this head, you can see that there is no nose here, uh, which looks very silly, of course, uh, at this particular stage. Uh, but I carve my... Uh, oh, well, when I have my base, where is the, the raw picture of the base? Here we go. So in this particular base, I cut off the nose, I fur the entire head, and then I later repattern the nose, and then I sew it back on onto the top like so. There's no particular reason why you should or shouldn't do this. I just like to. <laughs> Uh, the reason why I like to do so is because for making pickable noses, the ones where you can stick your finger right into the good old nostrils, uh, I find it's a little bit easier this way because then you can take it off, carve it the way you want, pattern it the way you want, and then stick it on. Because otherwise trying to pattern it while it's glued all to the head, I find it a little bit tricky because you're trying to glue and pattern something that's, you know, this big versus something that's, you know, this big. So it's, you know, easier to do you know, patterning something smaller in terms of being able to move it around. Uh, and then you can also play around the placement. And if you don't like it, it's easier to be like, mm, no, don't like this nose. I'm going to repattern it or I'm going to make a new nose, whatever have you. Um, you know, you, at this point, you clean up the shaving. Uh, you install the eyes, the nose, the teeth, uh, sorry, the eyeliner, um, the, the nose, the teeth, the tongue, all that. And your head is basically done. Now, an optional thing that you can do, um, is you can install the lining uh, if you haven't done so already. Because um, you can install the lining at any stage. I typically install it right at the beginning. So this black piece here, this is the actual lining. So I duplicate this, this lining out of fur and then I sew the two pieces together and that becomes the actual lining so that the uh, lining and the fur itself are perfectly matched and there's no bunching or anything like that. You can also just buy a balaclava and you can sew it into the head, which is a very quick and dirty way to make uh, lining on fursuit heads, which is also 
why people still tend to build their heads directly on a balaclava because the lining is already there for you, so it's you know it saves a step. Um, that's not to say that you won't want to wear a balaclava underneath a fursuit head anyways, because a balaclava you can take out, throw on the washing machine, and you can keep your head clean and a little bit sweaty-free. Um, let's see what's next. Uh, oh yeah, the bodysuits. So, with a bodysuit, people probably have heard this terminology before, but not everyone might know it. There are, is digigrade and plantigrade. A digigrade suit has foam or polyfill padding, which helps mimic this, uh, the shape of the desired animal. And uh, every animal is different, so shaping is important. Uh, whereas plantigrade, there is no padding, so it is human anatomy, uh, which you can see here by this photo I pulled off the internet. Um, with regardless of whether you're doing a uh, digigrade bodysuit or a plantigrade bodysuit, you're going to want to make a duct tape dummy. Uh, duct tape dummies should be made on old clothes, and you'll want a friend because you can't reach every part of your body, no matter how skinny and flexible you think you are. Um, now, the reason why I recommend making a DT on old clothes uh, is because a lot of people, a lot of makers, or a lot of people say, oh, go make it on a painter suit. Um, is because a painter suit, they tend to be made out of either basically paper or very, very thin plastic, and they'll tend to rip. Or tear. Same reason why you never want to make it on paper itself or on garbage bags because it doesn't have the strength you need. Because you have to think about it from the maker's perspective, unless you're building your own suit. You have to be able to stuff this DTD to the to the bursting point with foam or uh, with polyfill. And you have to be able to pick it up and throw it around because you're going to be picking up and moving this thing a lot. So you will want your DT to be fairly sturdy, which is why I recommend making it on clothes. So go sacrifice some clothes to the furry gods, um, you know, and conduct a terrifying ritual with your friend where they duct tape your entire body as if it's some BDSM ritual. Um, and you'll want to label your, your DTD, label it front, back, you know, etc. Um, and put a little X at uh, above your tailbone where the tail is going to be if you're doing a plantigrade bodysuit. A digigrade, the placement will be a little bit different depending on whether you're doing a drop crotch or a regular uh, digigrade. So, if you're just making a plantigrade bodysuit, you can actually completely carve up and destroy this DTD uh, and pattern directly onto the DTD. So, with a DTD, um, the uh, with a bodysuit, sorry, uh, the fur on your body will flow down from your shoulders to the wrists, flow down from the neck down towards the crotch, and down towards the legs. So it's very important to mark your fur direction. So you mark your fur direction, number one step, you draw your markings, you label your markings, and then for a plantigrade bodysuit, you can actually cut the DTD up right away and you can assemble it and sew it. Uh, this is a random image tutorial that I found online, but it, it details all the steps very simple. You pattern, you make your DTD, you draw the markings you have, you cut out your, um, your pattern pieces, you sew on the zipper, you assemble it, you turn it inside out, you put it on, and you have a good time. A digigrade bodysuit is, uh, a lot more work because you actually have to carve out a shape out of foam first and different animals have different shapes a you know a tiger or a lion will have a different placement of uh you know where their knees and the back of their legs are compared to say um a lizard or a dragon or a dog they all have different anatomy so this is a random image that i found offline and it can show immediately how the different ones were is this drop crotch anatomy would work really well for say like a hamster or an otter you know whoop. Uh, this is your more common, you know, feline, canine shape. Your lizards, you know, they don't have very much padding on the legs and the knees, but they have really big feet. Um, you know, fawns, you know, their, their paddings are up higher. They tend to be thinner, you know, harder angles. You know, each animal has a different shape. So it's important to look up 
pictures of the animal that you're trying to mimic or the species that you're trying to mimic before you start carving uh, your uh, foam pieces. And just like the head, you'll want to carve it out of foam, uh, but in this case, you can glue or tape the uh, carved foam pieces directly to your duct tape dummy. Um, this way, they don't move around a lot while you're trying to pattern them. Uh, once you are happy with the shape, you can then retape the duct tape dummy. So what I typically do is I buy, I go get saran wrap, and I saran wrap the entire GTD with the uh, new foam padding on top of it, and then I duct tape that. This way I can remove eight hours later. So once you are satisfied with uh, the shape of your uh, foam padding, you're going to saran wrap the entire thing and then you're going to re-duct tape uh, that saran wrap uh, shape of your whole body. This way you have um, the ability to um, mount your uh, finished bodysuit right on top of um, the uh, DTD. This way you can show it off, see how it fit, fits, etc. You want to take the foam piece here and the foam piece here and you're going to duct tape these pieces again um, but instead of this time making them out of fur, you're going to make them out of, say, fleece or lycra, and you're going to stuff them with polyfill, and you're going to sew them directly into the suit themselves. There are other ways to do it, but for new makers, this is the easiest way to go about it. Now, those are called polyfill pouches. There are other ways to go about making the padding, but that is the simplest way for new makers. Um, so, once you've got everything all happy, you basically duct tape the entire thing, you cut it out of fur, you mark, label everything, and you sew it up just as you would uh, the head and any other piece of the body. Uh, and it's all easy peasy lemon squeezy. The next part is the tail, which is the easiest part of the tail, uh, easiest part of the suit to make. You, you want to make a dog tail? Very easy. You take some pattern piece, you draw the shape of the canine tail exactly the way you want it, then you simply cut it out of fur. You will, of course, uh, you know, label, you know, uh, it A side and B side. You'll need to flip it. This way you have a left and a right. Remember to mark your fur direction. Um, the, the fur will always flow from the base of the tail to the tip of the tail. Um, and you'll want to, you know, label, you know, the colors, etc. You know, say you have a brown spot here. You draw the brown spot. You label it brown um, and so on and forth. Uh, and it's very simple. You basically are just going to cut two of these, you know, mirror them, you know, one out of, you know, side A and one out of side B, and you're going to sandwich them together, and you're going to sew it all up, uh, and then you're going to close it. Now, uh, one thing that you can do is you can take a piece of one-inch foam, and you can cut out a circle and put it in between the two halves, and that creates this round shape for you. Uh, and you can put your belt loops onto that foam piece. Alternatively, you can actually just sew it directly up and then sew uh, belt loops directly over top. Uh, belt loops are typically just, you know, done with elastic. Um, usually use like a one inch elastic and you sew it directly onto the fur or uh, onto the foam with a piece of like minky or fleece in between it, um, you know, to make it a little bit nice. And you stuff it, of course, and it's very, very easy to make a tail, very quick to make a tail. Um, you can make a tail in like 30 minutes, an hour, depending on the complexity, longer, obviously, if it's crazy designs. Um, but it's very simple. So if anyone wants to get into fursuit making, the first thing I recommend people is to make a tail. Because it's the fastest thing to make, the cheapest thing to make, and the quickest to make. And if you make mistakes or fuck it up completely, it's not a big loss of time or money. Uh, next are paws. There are a couple different kinds of paws. You have your puffy paws, which are the probably the most common and most popular type of paws, but they're also the more complex one because they have a lot more pattern pieces. Next are sandwich paws. Uh, they are called sandwich paws because you they are extremely simple. You have two pattern pieces and you sandwich them together and sew it. Then you have monster paws, which are paws that tend to be uh, they're also called Popeye paws, uh, where you have the big foam padding on it, or they have really, really big claws, um, so they're monster. Next, any creatures that are hooved have hoof paws. Um, I'm not going to be talking about monster paws and hoof paws today, just because we're running out of time, but we will talk about puppy paws and sandwich paws, starting with sandwich paws. 
Same with edge paws are the easiest ones to make. What you're going to do is on a pair a piece of tracing paper, you're going to spread your hand out really nice and wide, and then you're going to trace it around just as if you were in kindergarten, you know, making sure that, you know, you get your hand accurately. Once you have your trace, you're going to basically remove the first knuckle that you have by, oops, by drawing a line over top of them like so because if you go all the way down to the middle, like so, you're not going to, it's gonna to be too tight and you're not gonna have the dexterity needed to be able to grasp things, especially if you're doing five finger. If you have four fingered, it's a little bit different, a little bit easier, but you still don't wanna go all the way down because it will be too tight. Then you're going to draw the shape you want. You're going to want to make it nice and big and tuny and give yourself lots of room because once because the seams, because there's so, everything is so small and so tight on a hand, all of these seams are going to take up so much room on your actual pattern that you want to make it much bigger than what you think you're going to need. Uh, you're going to want to, of course, label everything, uh, mark your fur direction, and with fur, it will always flow from the wrist to the tips of the fingers, from here to here. Then you'll want to uh, probably pre-shave it. Now, because hands have a top and a bottom, you know, your the top of your hand and the palm of your hand, there are going to be different lengths of fur. Your fur will be shorter on the fingers and on the palm than they will be on the top of the hand on the wrist. So you're going to want to pre-shave the fingers here. And then on the other side, you're going to shave all of the fingers and the palm. Once you've pre-shaved it, then you're going to basically applique your paw pads. Applique is quite simple and it's the simplest way um, to make paw pads. It's not as uh, cost efficient, but it is the most reliable way. Every maker on the planet does this way. Basically, you take a sheet of fleece or minky, whatever you want to make your paw pads out of, you cut a big square, basically the size of the entire hand, and you put it face up on the fur. So the fur is face up and the minky or fleece is face up because it has a face, a right side and a wrong side. And you put them face up on top of each other. And then you pin it down, say here and here and here and here. And then you basically on the back side of your sewing machine, sorry, on, the, on your sewing machine, on the back side, so on the wrong side, you basically go over the trace that you made of your paw pads out of, uh, you know, on your sewing machine. So you're following the lines all the way around. And then when you flip it over, you have, you know, your outline of your paw pads in fleece or minky. And of course, then you have a big, ugly piece of material to suck to it. So what you do afterwards is you take a pair of scissors. Um, I usually like to use like high precision, fine little needle scissors. Um, and then you carefully cut around the edge of the paw pads very close to the actual seam the stitching itself but you don't want to cut the stitching itself because the stitching is what holds well the paw pads on um, and then once you have it all cut out uh, all the paw pads cut out then you basically take your uh, other uh, part of your paw and you sandwich the two pieces together so you sandwich the top of the paw and the paw uh, the palms with the paw pads together and you flip it inside out at that point, you can also add claws if desired. Usually when you're doing paw, sandwich paws, you typically use a resin claws or clay claws. But you can, of course, uh, still do uh, claws out of, say, minky or fleece. And with that, you're going to cut a little slit, either if you're doing out of fleecy, mink, or even clay uh, or resin. And you're going to basically insert the claws into the middle of the fingers right in here and you're gonna sew them shut or glue them in the case of resin or clay. Puffy paws are the most popular type of, of paws. Uh, typically people make four, uh, four paws, not fi uh, five, a fi four fingered, not five fingered uh, with puffy paws, most common, cuter, uh, a little bit less dexterity, but you know, uh, it tends to work well a lot for tuny suits uh, just because, you know, they're uh, very anthropomorphized uh, characters. They're very tuny, so there's, you know, less human anatomy, so they don't typically have thumbs. Um, now, 
Uh, puffy paws are definitely a more complex pattern. You have a lot more moving pieces. Um, you will have each of your fingers will be an individual piece, and there'll be two of them. One will be the bottom, where the paw pad is, and the other one will be the top, which is a finger. And the fingers will typically look like oh, will look like this. Now, this is not to scale, but... So you'll have... These will typically be your middle fingers, as they will be here. And these will typically be your thumbs or your pinkies, and they will have a curve, which will basically be this curve on the final piece. Then, of course, you have your claws, and the claws will actually go in this slit right here, which becomes the top of the hand, like so. Um, so claws can be easily sewn in. Sewn in. Um, so then you end up having usually about, depending if it's four-fingered or five-fingered, you tend to have one, two, oh gosh, I'm clicking on things, you end up one, two, three, four, five, uh, ten, uh, eleven, twelve 10, 12 pieces versus two. So it's a lot more, you know, pieces to it, you know, but you tend to have a lot, it has uh, more of a three-dimensional look versus a very flat look of the sandwich paws. Uh, now, the only thing to be noted with uh, puffy paws is that they either have to be lined or have polyfill pockets in order for the fingers to creep the three-dimensional shape. Otherwise, they will, you know, look very silly. <laughs> Um, but the final, but the final result of a puffy paw is that they're very cute. They're very iconic. It's what most people tend to think of uh, when they think of hand paws, uh, is they tend to think of puffy paws. Next are feet paws. There's a couple different kinds of feet paws. You have shoe paws, which are built on shoes. Sock paws, which are not always built on socks, but you know, a lot of people, some people do build them on socks. And then of course you have indoor feet paws and outdoor feet paws. Now, shoe paws versus sock paws, they each have their own pros and cons. Shoe paws are built on shoes, hence the name shoe paws. They are very durable, but they're also very heavy. Especially if you're using casted foam versus carved foam. Uh, but they can be indoor or outdoor, and they're very durable. Um, so they're, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll send the test of time, especially if you're someone who's very hard on your feet. Um, and you go through a lot of shoes in, you know, in your regular life quite quickly. Shoe paws are definitely something you're going to want to do versus, say, a sock paw. Uh, now, the sock paw shape comes from either being built on socks, but not a lot of people do that anymore. It was something that was common when for sock paws were kind of first you know, coming out as a, a technique. Uh, but nowadays, um, people tend to actually just build them straight out of, uh, you know, their fur and their lining uh, and polyfill. Uh, so the shape itself comes from the polyfill. Uh, they can be digigrade, which is a lot easier because it's, it's a little bit difficult to make digigrade shoe paws because the shoe is so, uh, it doesn't have a lot of give to it. So it can be very difficult to put your foot in uh, the feet paws if it's degraded. It's, it's difficult to put them in even when they're just regular, you know, going up to about the ankle um, versus going up to, say, the knee. Uh, so a shoehorn would absolutely be required if you want to make a degrade shoe paws. You can be done, but it's difficult. And typically you'll want a zipper on shoe paws that are degrade versus um, polyfill. So the sock paws... Um, they can be degrade. They're harder to make durable because they are literally just fur and stuffing, uh, and maybe a little bit of foam on the bottom just for comfort. So they're you know they're not suited for walking a lot. They're really only useful for being uh, at conventions, being indoor. You know because they're very cute. Um, so they're best suited for indoor as such. And you can make them outdoor, but they're not as durable. Um, uh, they're also extremely light um, because there's no foam to them and there's no heavy shoes in them. Um, and it also makes storing them very easy because you can completely vacuum seal the paws, <laughs> which is something that I usually do when I'm going to a convention. I just vacuum seal my suit so I think it gets squished down flat and then I save so much room in the car. Uh, then, of course, you have indoor uh, and outdoor. So in an indoor uh, shoe, has paw pads and fur on the bottom. Uh, so these ones are indoor, um, but they don't have paw pads in this particular case because the, you know, the species didn't have paw pads. But normally, uh, in or indoor uh, feet paws would have paw pads on the bottom. Whereas an outdoor one, it would be 
uh, a rubber or EVA foam mat on the bottom. Uh, outdoor paws are best suited for walking around outside. Um, and if you built your outdoor paws on shoes, then you know they you know they'll last quite quite a while because they're you know shoes are meant for walking quite literally. Uh, whereas, you know, costume sock paws are not really meant for, you know, walking. So they'll, they'll erode quite quickly if you wear them outside. Um, and then, of course, indoor uh, paws are great for conventions because then you can have those really cute uh, pictures where you, you know, you're laying on your, on your rump and you have your feet outstretched and it's showing all the beans and, you know, it's quite cute. But other than aesthetic purposes, indoor uh, feet paws, uh, you know, don't really serve much purpose um, compared to, say, outdoor, which are meant for walking. But again, it's a preference thing. There's no right or wrong answer. Um, and that is basically how you make a fursuit. I know we rushed through this quite a bit. I know there was a bit of a shit show with the random people coming to the door, uh, but um, I do hope you guys enjoyed this. Now, we will be doing another panel, uh, which will be Fursuit Making 102. Uh, and we will be going over the more advanced techniques like how to make molds, casting, 3D printing, and even hand wefting and so on and so forth. So feel free to join us then. Thank you very much, and I'll see you guys later. Bye!